This episode is brought to you by LifeLock. Cybersecurity Awareness Month is still going strong, and LifeLock is here with a message about phishing, the scam cyber criminals use to trick victims into allowing access to their devices so they can steal their personal info. Being aware of phishing scams is one way to help protect yourself. For comprehensive identity theft protection, there's LifeLock. Start protecting your identity today with a 30-day free trial at lifelock.com slash podcast. Do you like the Daily Blast but want even more analysis of the biggest headlines from around the world? Do you want an ad-free listening experience so there's nothing between you and expert commentary every day? Consider becoming a member of the DSR Network, where you'll also gain access to exclusive content across all of the DSR Network podcasts. Listeners of The Daily Blast can get 30% off of a monthly or annual membership using code BLAST at the dsrnetwork.com forward slash buy. That's code BLAST at the dsrnetwork.com slash buy. This is the Daily Blast from the New Republic, produced and presented by the DSR Network. I'm your host, Greg Sargent. All of a sudden, the word fascist has fully penetrated the presidential race. We just learned that a top general under President Donald Trump described Trump as fascist to the core. Trump has been threatening to unleash the military and the enemy within which numerous observers have described as fascist politics. And at an event on Wednesday, Trump uncorked a long, strange, rambling response to all this, in which he said, the real fascists are Democrats. Today we're taking a different angle on all this, looking at how the American right really has overlapped with fascist movements in the U.S. throughout our history. We're talking to David Austin Walsh, a historian and author of a great new book, Taking America Back, which takes a deep look at the history of the far right in this country. Really glad to have you on, David. Thank you for having me. Let's start with Trump's appearance at a Fox News town hall on women's issues, which had an all-female audience. He responded to criticism of his recent threat to use the military on the enemy within this way. And it is the enemy from within, and they're very dangerous. They're Marxists and communists and fascists, and they're sick. The more difficult are, you know, the Pelosi's, uh, these people, they're so sick and they're so evil. If they would spend their time trying to make America great again, we would have, it would be so easy to make this country great. But when I heard about that, they, they were saying I was like threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They do phony investigations. So let's clarify again that the prosecutions of Trump are based on evidence. They're in keeping with the rule of law. There's zero evidence that President Biden or Vice President Harris have directed any of them. They're being overseen by judges and heard by juries. That aside, David, what do you think of the fact that Trump called his opponents fascists while reiterating that the enemy within must be targeted and purged? Well, I mean, I, I think there's a, a tremendous uh, irony uh, in uh, how Trump has expressed himself here. I mean, he has in the past called his uh, domestic critics uh, uh, fascists and communists, Marxists. He's also used uh, terms like vermin uh, to describe his political opponents. Um, there are obviously uh, resonances with uh, rhetoric from uh, fascist and far right leaders uh, you know, across the globe uh, who have who have engaged in not just in similar rhetoric, but have actually used that rhetoric as the basis for action um, against uh, uh, their political opponents. Um, on the, this, but, but what I think is really interesting is um, how he has sort of reappropriated the term fascism to describe his political opponents, right? You know, ever since 2016, there has been a discussion in academic circles of actually a fairly raging debate about whether or not you can characterize Trump or Trumpism as fascist or fascistic. Um, you know, I, I agree with many of my uh, colleagues who are historians who uh, say, yes, that's a fair, uh, uh, that's a fair term. And, and if, I mean, Vice President Harris just uh, said this the other day, that it's a fair term to, uh, to characterize Trump. Um, 
but but the sort of usage of fascist by um, Trump and other Republicans directed against Democrats, directed against their political opponents, either uh, liberals or on the left, um, that in and of itself also has a, a sort of a, an interesting history. Um, Jonah Goldberg, who was a, a, a pundit uh, at uh, National Review for many years, I, he has now since left the conservative movement. Uh, he was actually one of the more prominent Never Trumpers in 2016. You know, but he wrote a book in 2007, I believe, uh, may, might have been 2008 when it, was, when it was originally published, called Liberal Fascism, which is all about how, you know, liberals and specifically Hillary Clinton are, you know, the real heirs of the fascist tradition in American politics and American progressivism is, is sort of a descendant to Mussolini. Um, and, and so, you know, that's sort of the language that Trump that is tapping into. David, you write in your book that conservatives have historically reacted very badly when described by liberals and leftists as fascists. But at the same time, parts of the American right really did bleed into fascist movements in the U.S., uh, it's really true that liberals have historically feared the resurgence of fascism in various forms over the decades with some justification. Can you very briefly recap that history for us? Yeah. I mean, I think after World War II, there was a, there was a general sense in, in America that on the one hand, you know, fascism had been defeated overseas. Germany was defeated. Italy was defeated. Japan's defeated. Um, but there remained this kind of domestic fascist tradition, which you saw, you know, either in Jim Crow or, you know, among business leaders in the aftermath of World War II. Um, and there was all of this sort of anxiety at the time about whether or not, you know, a new fascist strain could reemerge and become dominant again in American politics. This is how so many people understood the rise of Joe McCarthy, because this mapped on exactly to those types of anxieties. You have and the John eyes. Birch Society too, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and and the two are very much interrelated. You have Joe McCarthy emerging as this demagogic, extreme right-wing anti-communist figure um, uh, in the early 1950s. And then, of course, he completely implodes uh, after 1954. And then the John Birch Society, which is founded in 1958, is founded by the people who were Joe McCarthy's biggest defenders and cheerleaders, uh, who you know held that he did nothing wrong, that he was unfairly smeared as like you know as as a, as a fascist or a Nazi uh, by his political opponents. And, and the John that, Birch Society bled into fascist movements uh, at the time, right? Well, one of the founding members of the John Birch Society was a man named Revilo Oliver, who was a professor of classics at the University of Illinois. He was a, a renowned uh, Sanskrit scholar. He's also uh, a, a contributor to a National Review magazine and close friends with William F. Buckley. Um, he became a uh, sort of founding father of the uh, modern American Nazi movement. He was uh, 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 instrumental in the uh, creation of the National Alliance. Uh, in the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, which is historically one of the most important white supremacist organizations in uh, in the United States. Um, so these were not people who were at the periphery of, I mean, the John Birch Society was hardly at the periphery of American conservatism in the 1950s and 60s. And people who became neo-Nazis were hardly uh, in the periphery of the John Birch Society. Well, right. And to return to Trump's rant for a second, he called his opponents fascists including the Pelosi's, which is funny since a crazed lunatic savagely attacked Nancy Pelosi's husband in a violent assault, and Trump and MAGA figures have actually mocked that and made light of it. This kind of language of flirtation with political violence and really kind of almost direct calls for it, the valorization of the January 6th uh, rioters as patriots and heroes, um, the intimations from people like Marjorie Taylor Greene of political violence. And this stuff sounds fascistic to a lot of people. You actually hear echoes of past right-wing language in that current stuff, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, th th there have been these fantasies of regenerative violence, um, you know, on the American right uh, for a very long time. Um I write about this a little bit in my book, but in the mid 1960s, uh, the John Birch Society organized uh, these things called American Opinion bookstores. The idea was that you know it would be this outlet in your local town that sold right wing literature about how you know the civil rights movement was infiltrated by the communists, that sort of thing. Um, and in practice, uh, what happened was these became spaces uh, uh, for uh, extreme uh, uh, right wingers to uh, come and congregate and talk about.
uh, the need for violence uh, against uh, their uh, perceived domestic political opponents. So liberals, leftists, communists, the civil rights movement, uh, student radicals. I mean, this is in the mid to late 1960s. Um, you know, and you would see people like George Wallace and even even to a certain extent, not, not necessarily Richard Nixon himself, but Spiro Agnew came close to embracing this kind of language. It's the need for uh, 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 violence uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, to suppress uh, uh, student unrest um, on American college campuses in the late 60s and early 70s. So, and, you know, uh, there was a lot of violence deployed against campus protesters uh, uh, back in those days, um, you know, by, you know, infamously. Certainly yeah, it was. Um, infamously at, at Kent State uh, 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 in 1970, but I mean, the list goes on. There, there were, you know, Berkeley, elsewhere. So, you know, that is not... Um, that 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 rings some alarm bells. That's not a uh, uh, that that's not something that that can just be uh, dismissed as rhetorical excess. General Mark Milley uh, sounded an alarm bell himself. Former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Trump years described Trump as fascist to the core and a total fascist, according to Bob Woodward's new book. Now, Milley discusses a 2020 meeting at which Trump, as president, threatened to retaliate against two retired military officers who criticized him. We're now seeing a marked escalation in the kind of language of retribution and the threats from Trump. He's now running on an explicit platform promising authoritarian violence. Um, Can you put that in the historical context for us? I mean, is that something new on the right to kind of run on a promise of retributive violence in this way? I, I think yes. Uh, so certainly in, in modern American history, and let's just, for the sake of argument, let's just say modern begins in roughly the 1920s. Um, that's typically how I periodize this when I teach modern U.S. history start in the 1920s. Um, th- there really hasn't been a, um, a campaign from a major political party that has so openly run on this on the desire for and the prescription for uh, restorative violence, uh, restorative state violence, and and also non-state violence against domestic political opponents. Um, the closest one that I can that that, that comes to mind is uh, George Wallace's 1968 uh, third party presidential run. Um, one of the things that I find really disturbing, and I'll take off my historian's hat and put on my political pundit hat, but one of the things I find really disturbing about Trump's, uh, about the 2024 uh, campaign cycle, the campaign, uh, the election he- this year, is uh, Trump's selection of J.D. Vance um, as his running mate and the uh, codification of a sort of proto-platform in Project 2025, which of course Trump has disavowed, but... I personally don't take that disavowal all that seriously uh, because J.D. Vance is exactly the guy you would pick to be the major influence in the administration if you were serious about implementing that vision. And, you know, and and you at uh, New Republic have covered this very, very extensively. I mean, it is a vision to establish a an authoritarian presidency, um, certainly beyond the scope of any uh, authoritarian presidency that we've seen in the past, including including Nixon. Um and and that's uh, it, it's it's the combination of the rhetoric of violence, which which again, to be fair, from Trump is not new. I mean, he he did talk like this, not quite so extremely, but he did talk like this in twenty sixteen and twenty twenty. Although, David, um, I think he has been more explicit in threatening the use of the military. Yes, I think that's right, um, and I think that, I mean. I remember having this conversation with uh, friends and colleagues back in 2020. I was less concerned. I was not concerned uh, that Trump would be able to successfully hold on to power after the November election if he lost. And I was saying this back in July or August uh, because, which is not to say that I wasn't concerned about the potential for violence. And there was, of course, a tremendous amount of violence with the January 6th uh, attempted coup. But I was not concerned that that would be successful. And the reason was that in uh, the summer of 2020, Trump 
wanted to use the military to suppress the George Floyd uprisings. I was living in D.C. at the time, and we were very concerned, those of us who were living there in the district itself, that, you know, at any moment, the 101st Airborne could come in and, you know, you could see the military on the streets in a very sort of explicit way. That didn't happen. And that didn't happen because of the opposition of people like Milley, the generals. Um, you know, because he clearly did not have the support of the military that limited his ability to sort of impose his will uh, in the aftermath of the election. Now, what Project 2025 suggests, what his various staffing decisions have suggested, the fact that he is uh, so keen on talking about using the military in um, in this election cycle, it suggests to me that they have they are serious. They have a plan to install loyalists in these various positions. They are serious about the uh, 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 deportation of 10 or 15 million people, uh, depending on which figure you they, they feel like using at any given time. In order to do that, you need a robust state infrastructure, a robust enforcement mechanism to to deport that number of people. That I mean, they really, really, I mean, I some people have dismissed that uh, uh, that policy platform as sort of unserious, um, as not in keeping with Project Twenty Twenty Five and this idea that you're going to you know defang or purge the federal government. Well, how are you going to do that while well, also building up this sort of new enforcement mechanism? I mean, to me, the purpose of that is to create a, uh, a powerful um, sort of law enforcement slash paramilitary institution that is loyal to Trump um, and his closest associates uh, primarily. Let me hop in here and say that uh, we should we should remember that Trump has explicitly talked about using the National Guard to carry out some of these uh, mass deportations, which is uh, a direct declaration that he will use the military in some sense to carry out domestic policy. Um, and Stephen Miller has endorsed the idea of uh, red state National Guards going into blue states to carry out some of these operations. This is sort of very much in keeping with what you're talking about. And also, let's also remind people that when there was a crackdown on the protesters outside the White House in 2020, those generals who resisted actually uh, stepped forward and had to reaffirm the military's commitment to the Constitution over Trump, which I think really underscored what you're talking about here, that there was really a sense in which Trump was trying to win their loyalty to him and over the country for all sorts of nefarious ends. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it, it strikes me that the big question um, and hopefully this is not something that is going to have to be a drip because hopefully he will lose decisively or at least um, conclusively um, in uh, November. Um, but the sort of civil institutions held barely um, in his first term. And uh, I, I, again, um, between Vance and Project 2025 and some of the other key staffing decisions, uh, it, it does to me suggest that there is a serious uh, plan to uh, uh, actually to, to to try to uh, uh, undermine and unravel um, those institutions uh, in, in, a, in a very sort of serious and strategic uh, strategic way. Um, I think people should realize also that Project Twenty Twenty Five uh, contains a. a uh, a, a, um, a blueprint for uh, purging the federal government and replacing, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of officials with Trump loyalists. And that's really key to, to carrying out the type of thing you're talking about. I want to go back to your book for a sec. Uh, one thing you draw out is that we need to take the history of fascist movements in the U.S. more seriously as a genuine component of the American political tradition and that this should inform our understanding of the right more broadly. I want to ask you to apply that to MAGA. I mean, it's a movement that's all about purging and purifying the nation with mass expulsions, fantasies about the nation being in decline, about retribution for all kinds of resentments and humiliations over imagined victimhood, and so forth. Trump speaks to those impulses very directly. Uh, how do you think about all that? Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that I um, that I try to get at um, in the book is to not think about fascism as something that is um, 
the, the, that is alien or foreign to um, the American political tradition. I mean, you have sort of fascistic movements on the right that emerge during the 1930s. Ironically enough, and I mean, this gets back to what we were talking about earlier, many of them you know, we'll start out by saying that, well, actually, FDR is the real fascist <laughs> for you building up the New Deal state. Um, so much of where that political energy comes from in the 1930s is opposition to uh, organized labor um, and its influence in creating what, it, you know, what becomes a sort of dominant framework in American politics, the New Deal coalition for the next uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, there's a tremendous amount of uh, anti-Semitism in the movement at the time as well, um, which I think extends through to the present day. Uh, but that, you know, it comes from a combination of sort of, of, of sort of broader conspiratorial anti-Semitism about, you know, Jewish radicalism and, and you know, global conspiracies, um, as well as um, in the case of one uh, specific figure I write about in the book, Merwin Hart. Um, a kind of political calculation that, well, actually it is these immigrants, many of whom are Jews, that are ultimately sort of responsible for the electoral coalition that's putting his hated enemy, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, into, into the White House. Um, you know, and you see uh, resonances of this uh, throughout the rest of the 20th century. I mean, Pat Buchanan, um, who was, of course, a prominent uh, prominent figure in the Nixon administration, and later the Reagan administration, and then... and really a precursor to Trump in many ways. Exactly, ran for president in 1992 on a platform that I mean, he he has, I believe, uh, said uh, in the past uh, couple of years that uh, he he basically takes credit for Trumpism because uh, uh, what Donald Trump was saying in 2016 is what he was saying in 1992, and I think I think rightly so. I mean, John Gans uh, wrote that wonderful book uh, when the clock broke about this subject uh, earlier this year, or it was published earlier this year. So, you know, I, I think that there is this sort of deeper uh, history, and it's also not, uh, again, that far removed from mainstream conservatism. One of the things I talk about in the book repeatedly is how um, people in mainstream conservative institutions, I focus on National Review, um, the, you know, William F. Buckley's famous magazine, uh, so many people in that orbit um, end up becoming explicit Nazis uh, uh, over the course of their uh, careers. Reveal Oliver, I mentioned before, George Lincoln Rockwell, who uh, became the head of the American Nazi Party, worked for National Review briefly. Uh, Joseph Brand, um, who was uh, one of Buckley's protégés um, in the 1970s, um, sort of his replacement for Gary Wills after Wills wrote Nixon Agonists um, and became uh, sort of a critic of American conservatism. Um Sabran uh, became a Holocaust denier in the 1990s. Yeah, I mean the 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 lines between uh, fascist movements and and parts of the far right have been pretty blurry. I mean, one thing that really strikes me, just to wrap this up, David, listening to you talk, is that this debate about whether Trump is a fascist, um, whether the word is appropriate, and so forth, it's sort of amazing that it's confined to mostly academics. I mean. Take Milley's description of Trump as a full-blown fascist. Top general describes the Republican presidential candidate as a fascist, right? Uh, the American press has not really covered that extensively. Media Matters found very little broadcast news coverage of it and not a lot in the major papers. But this should have prompted a major national debate. No, I mean, as a historian, does the, the reticence to go here surprise or even alarm you? And should we be talking about this a little more right now? One of the problems is that there has been this debate, uh, not, and it's been primarily among academics, but it's it's sort of filtered out from time to time into the uh, into the broader media about you know this question of whether or not Trump is a fascist, and it's gotten pretty vociferous at times. Um, but I, but I, the I, I think the broader point is we've been we've been having this conversation for almost a decade now. Um, and yet he is still in a position where he could, I mean, I was just looking at the polls before I came on, uh, on 538. I mean, it's, it's a coin toss, it seems. I mean, I, you know, there, there's some cause for optimism in, in North Carolina, but it's a coin toss. And so, you know, what does that say about the health of American political institutions when a guy who has, I think, been accurately described as a threat to democracy, as an authoritarian, who... I, I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I find it difficult to just even express this, but just the, a, a man who uh, uh, attempted to violently subvert the outcome 
of a presidential election is still in a position to potentially win on, you know, wi- you know, possibly even fair and square um, uh, the, the next election cycle. That To me, that just speaks uh, to the uh, uh, real uh, uh, degradation of our uh, of our democracy and our political institutions. I mean, you know, when people talk, when people make the Weimar analogy, which often comes up in these conversations about fascism, um, I, I think that there is uh, just a, 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 a you know, a, a tendency to, to think about history as sort of a blueprint for, OK, well, you know, the beer hall putsch failed when Hitler tried to seize power in Munich in 23. But that means that, you know, that there there is still this danger of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of some kind of uh, seizure of power in the future by you know, Trump in this analogy. And uh, OK, that's all well and good. But the real value of the Weimar analogy is about the fragility of German political institutions, um, the poor strategic decisions made by all sorts of German political leaders in the case in the 1920s and 30s, um, along with sort of broader macro uh, economic and political trends. Um, and, and you know, that to me, it, it's it's we we, we kind of know what ails American democracy. Right. We know what the structural problems in American uh, politics are. Um, and for a variety of reasons, they, they're not we have not been capable of solving them. And there are, of course, real political reasons, real political obstacles, uh, you know, to that, like you know, abolishing the filibuster, that sort of thing. Um, but there are consequences to not to to, to that kind of lack of structural reform. Um, and I think that, uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the real dangers here is that it it, it puts somebody like Trump within uh, a spitting distance of the White House yet again. I mean, here we are again. Absolutely well said. Really alarming. I would just add that I think a lot of this goes to how uh, screwed up our discourse is and our information environment is. I mean, uh, there's been polling that shows that a lot of swing voters are simply unaware of Trump's Mm -hmm. most vivid and explicit authoritarian threats. And that's really, I think, a big contributor to the problem. And Trump knows how screwed up our discourse is. He he just goes out and he just laughs off the label and just applies it to his opponent. Well, if anyway. I can, if I can if I can interject here and and I just add something real quick. I mean, part of the other problem is even the people who know don't believe it. They don't believe that Trump is. I mean, th- there has been a lot of reporting about this recently that people who hear Trump saying these things don't think he's serious about it or don't think that he's referring to them. Um, and that that's a problem that I I mean, I don't know how to solve that, but it's a real, real serious one. Well, we may have to learn the hard way, David. Uh, David Austin Walsh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, fascinating, if harrowing discussion. It's my pleasure. You've been listening to The Daily Blast with me, your host, Greg Sargent. The Daily Blast is a New Republic podcast and is produced by Riley Fessler and the DSR Network. 